السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي All praise is due to Allah alone In Him we seek aid and assistance And to Him we turn both in repentance and for forgiveness Truly He whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides None can mislead And He whom Allah leaves to go astray There is none who can guide and I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship save Allah alone and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is both his slave and his messenger. Uh, this is a little bit interesting. Alhamdulillah, standing in the middle. I don't know where to look. <laughs> uh, you know, I had an outline today of notes and a speech kind of prepared for what I wanted to talk about today concerning the topic of civic engagement and what's expected of us as Muslims to be civically engaged. But of course, all of us are reeling from emotions over what happened in New Zealand to our brothers and sisters over there. And we've seen the images and we've seen this terrible, terrible act of violence and terrorism against people who are just worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their place of sanctuary. And I think for many of us, one of the most difficult things that we're dealing with looking at those images and seeing that story is that it's not shocking. It's terrible. It's gut-wrenching. It's dizzying. It's shaking. It's shaking us to our core. But it's not shocking. And it's because we know, just like we knew before the Quebec mosque shooting, that we've heard the rhetoric. We've heard the things that they say about us. We've heard the propaganda. We've seen the politicians taking advantage of racism and hatred against Muslims. And we've seen the ease by which this hatred proliferates. And so we're not shocked. And the terrifying thought that all of us have is that if nothing changes, what happened in New Zealand will probably happen again. And that's a very terrifying shock and thought that people could have. And when you have this terrifying thought in your mind, that the next time you're in a masjid, you might be thinking, well, is the next person who's going to walk into the doors is that person going to do something terrible? The problem with having that fear and that terrifying sh thought running through your mind is that it makes you act in ways that you normally wouldn't act. That it would make you all of a sudden want to start inching away from who you were. That it makes you all of a sudden want to stop looking Muslim. It makes you want to stop going to places that Muslims gather. It makes you want to stop going to the masjid altogether. Because that terrifying thought is running through your mind. And so I decided today I'm just going to throw out the playbook, throw out the notes that I had. And kind of want to talk about something a little bit different. And talk to you all a little bit more from my heart rather than what I had initially prepared. And the first, thing, <clears throat> the first thing I really want to tell all of you as a piece of advice is don't lose hope. In the aftermath of what we all witnessed, don't lose hope. It can be so easy when you're looking at the face of all of this evil, when you're looking at the face of all of this tragedy, it can be so easy to lose hope. When you're sitting even in your own masjid, in your place of security and comfort in that place that you think even here I'm not safe it can be so easy to lose hope when you see millions of dollars that are being funneled into the Islamophobia industry with no goal but to harm us as Muslims and to spread lies about us and our religion it can be so easy to lose hope what can we do against millions of dollars every year that are spent in this cause? But my message to you is don't ever lose hope. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Qur'an 
gives us example after example of people who remained hopeful in the most dire circumstances that confronted them. Allah tells you the example of Musa alayhi salam. When he was confronted by a sea in front of him, and behind him an army with their swords unsheathed, with their spears tilted, ready to kill every single one of them. And those around Musa said what many of us are thinking today. They said, Inna lamudrakun. We're going to be overcome. We're ruined. What hope do we have? Look at all that they have. And what do we have? And Musa said to them, Kalla inna ma'i rabbi sayahdeen. He said, no. My Lord is with me and he will guide me. He had optimism and hope. He had hope in the most dire circumstance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be with them. That Allah would defend them. That Allah would protect them. That Allah would be on their side no matter the circumstance that they were in. كَلَّا إِنَّ مَعِي رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ He had beautiful thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Optimism towards the future. And knowledge that as long as I am on the correct path, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with me and will strengthen me and will aid me. And no matter the result of this circumstance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will is dominant over the will of everyone else. That's optimism. The optimism of Ya'qub alayhi salam. When he tells his children, Idhabu fatahassasu an Yusuf wa akhi. Go and seek out the knowledge. Go find out what's happened to Yusuf and his brother. And his son said to him, They said, Father, he's been gone for so long. Why are you still talking to us about Yusuf? Why do you care about him after all these years? Why do you still have hope? And he said, إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُ مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْكَافِرُونَ He said, nobody despairs from the relief of Allah except those who disbelieve. Nobody despairs from the belief of Allah while you have iman, while you have faith. You never lose hope. You're always optimistic. You always know no matter how dire the circumstances I am are in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has my back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid us and protect us and defend us no matter the circumstances. And we see it in our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When they witnessed al-Ahzab, the Arabs never united. They were always tribes fighting against each other. Then all of a sudden they decided to unite. It's not that different than today. All these groups that hate Muslims, they used to all hate each other. Now today, they're all united in their hatred of Muslims. All of a sudden, all those tribes united to destroy Islam. And they gathered outside of Medina. The largest army the Arabs had ever seen. Right outside of Medina, ready to exterminate all of the Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابَ قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ when the believers saw this army, when they saw the soldiers, when they saw the swords, when they saw the arrows, when they saw them lined up to kill them, they said, this is what God and His Messenger have promised us. This is what Allah and His Messenger have promised us. They promised us that there's going to be difficulty before there's relief. They promised us there's going to be hardship before there's, there's going to be finally relief and victory and success. And they were truthful. And it did not increase them in anything except in faith and except in submitting to Allah. Turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah mentions another group of people who saw the same army coming. And they were the hypocrites. And Allah said, He said, you guys had bad assumptions. You guys did not think that you're ever going to live. 
You thought you're ruined. You thought you're destroyed. You had no hope. بَلْ كُنْتُمْ قَوْمًا بُورًا You were people who were pessimistic. Allah criticized them because they didn't have hope. Allah criticized them because they didn't have hope that Allah Azza wa Jal would aid and protect the believers. And that's the first point that we have to understand. That you need to be hopeful. That you're dealing with a Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala who is powerful, who is al-qawi, who his strength is above all else, whose will is above everyone else's will. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمَا مِنْ يَدٍ إِلَّا يَدُ اللَّهِ فَوْقَهَا there is no hand except the hand of God is above it and more dominant above it. And so this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are dealing with. How can we not have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I really thought I was going to have a podium. But, ayakum <laughs> Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about the hypocrites, he said, وَزُيِّنَ ذَلِكَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ this pessimism became beautiful in their hearts. How often do we hear this? The Muslims are ruined. Look what's happened in Palestine. Look what's happened in Syria. Look what's happened in Burma where people are burned alive. Look what's happened in the Central African Republic to Muslims being massacred. Look what just happened in New Zealand. We're ruined. We're going to be destroyed. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, بَلْ كُنْتُمْ قَوْمًا bura." You were people who were destroyed because you were pessimistic. The believer is always full of optimism. The believer is the one who is always recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there in his power. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a better future to the believer. In that same battle, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was breaking some rocks. And he was saying, Allahu Akbar, we were given the castles. We were given the keys to the castles in Persia. And the hypocrites are looking at the Prophet ﷺ. And they said, this man is saying we're going to get keys to castles in Persia and Yemen. And we're being attacked and we're going to be destroyed tomorrow. What's wrong with him? They said the Prophet was crazy. No, the Prophet ﷺ had hope. And hope is what defines the believer. And we need to have that hope as well. And that brings me to the second point that I wanted to convey today. Is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't lose hope. And don't be afraid. Don't allow the fear of things that we've witnessed and things that are said about us to change who we are. The point of all terrorism is to make people so afraid that they act differently than they normally would. And we're going to defeat that by not being afraid. We're going to defeat that by persevering. We're going to defeat that by going to the masjid like we normally would. We're going to defeat that by praying to Allah like we normally would pray. And if anything, we're going to go to the masjid even more. Because we're not going to allow that type of fear to dictate the way that we live our lives. And in fact, beyond that, we're going to recognize that iman... Faith, the very thing that we're chasing after, it is baked in the oven of tragedy and hardship. When we see the tragedy and hardship, like what happened to our brothers and sisters in New Zealand, we recognize that that is an oven through which our faith is going to be baked. That our faith is going to come to us and be delivered to us because of the hardship that we're going through today. Look at the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. And he has his two-year-old son Ibrahim, who he loved tremendously. The Prophet used to go around the streets telling people, Araita Ibrahim, have you seen my son Ibrahim? That's how much he loved him. And when he was only two years old, Ibrahim got ill and was heaving unable to breathe. And the Prophet ﷺ was crying and he cried so much, more than the companions had ever seen him cry. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf said to the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, Ya Rasulullah, ma He said, O Messenger of Allah, what is this? What are all these tears? Why are you crying this much? They never saw him crying so much before, facing that tragedy. And the Prophet ﷺ said, قَالَ إِنَّهَا رَحْمَةً 
إِنَّهَا رحمة. He said, this is a mercy. Yes, this tragedy, this hardship, this difficulty that caused the Prophet to cry so much, this is a mercy. And I say to you, all the tragedies that we witness today, these are mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's only through going through this hardship and this difficulty, it's only through going and witnessing and persevering without succumbing to fear that our iman is going to be worthy of something. What is your iman worthy of if it's never been tested and overcome the test? What is your faith worthy of if it's never gone through hardship and difficulty and overcome that hardship and difficulty? And the companions knew this. They knew this. They understood this. This is why Bilal radiallahu an would be tortured. And it would not prevent him from saying ahadun ahad that God is one, God is one. This is what caused Ammar ibn Yasir to see his whole family killed and hung from the tops of trees. And he still believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Khabbab radiallahu an the one who was being burned by his owner, that she would take the coals and the hot iron and burn off his back. He came to the Prophet ﷺ. Don't talk to me about the Islamophobia we see today. Think about the Islamophobia they saw in Mecca. Imagine every single day they're grabbing Khabbab and they're burning his skin. And this same Khabbab came to the Prophet ﷺ while the Prophet was at the Kaaba. And he said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Ala Tad'ullah Lana, Ala Tastansir Lana, O Messenger of God, will you not pray for us? Will you not ask Allah to give us victory? Meaning, O Messenger of Allah, haven't you seen what we're living through right now? Haven't you seen the hardship and the tragedy that we are living through right now? Won't you ask Allah to give us victory now? And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, He said, إِنَّهُ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ That indeed there were people before you that would be taken and tortured. That, the man would be, that they would put a saw to the head of a man and saw him until they split his body in two. And they would take the iron combs to the back of a man and comb them until they separated the flesh from the bone. And he was talking about some of the followers of Prophet Isa, Jesus alayhi salam, that this was some of the torture that they faced. He said, some of the people before you faced this type of torture. And this never repelled him away from his religion. They went through that hardship and they never churned away from their religion. And then he said to Khabbab, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ But you people are being hasty. You're not being patient enough. You're being hasty. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ, he's not telling you or me that we're being impatient. He's telling Khabbab, who is being tortured every day, he's telling him, you are being impatient. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ is conveying an important message. He's saying, that it's only through going through the tragedy, it's only going through the hardship that allows the person's faith to be worthy of something. And you have to go through that hardship and to emerge with a great moral sense of duty in order for your faith to be worthy of something. <coughs> And that's a really important point for us to understand. We can't have victory from Allah, success from Allah, while we are not on the proper moral footing. When we have the proper moral footing, Allah Azza will give you all the success. <coughs> and that brings me to my final point. We said don't lose hope. Don't be afraid. And finally, keep working. You have to have a great 
sense of moral capability and moral obligation and moral duty that is within your fiber as a person in order for Allah to give us success. So you have to keep working. <coughs> Apologize. A lot of us are worried and scared. We're worried about Islamophobia, what's going to happen if I leave my house. You know, there's a really beautiful dua of the Prophet ﷺ that he said whenever he would leave his house, he would make this dua. He would say, Allahumma ni'udhu bika an adhilla aw udhal aw adhlim aw udhlam aw an ajhal aw yujhal alayh. He said, Oh Allah, I seek refuge that I am humiliated or that I am led astray or that I am treated unjustly or that I treat others unjustly or that I am ignorant or that I act ignorantly against others. And that's a really powerful dua. And it's really powerful today in our day and age Because that dua is teaching you a lesson. If you do not want to be treated with oppression, you need to make sure you're not treating others with oppression. If you want to make sure that you are not treated with ignorance, you need to ensure that you are not treating others with ignorance. Because the Prophet is saying, I do not want to be unjust, nor do I want to treat other people with unjust, injustice. And that is our moral authority. And we have to think deeply about the type of moral authority that we want to deliver to society. And when we talk about civic engagement, this is what civic engagement is from our Islamic perspective. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ النَّاسَ إِذَا رَأَوُ الظَّالِمُ فَلَمْ يُنْكِرُوا عَلَيْهِ If the people see an oppressor and do not oppose that oppressor, <coughs> That indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will cover all of the people in his punishment. If we see oppression and evil, and we don't oppose it, and we don't fight against it, that perhaps Allah will punish all of us. And this is what we call civic engagement. This is what we call our sense of moral obligation and duty. Unfortunately, most of us, when we talk about civic engagement, we just talk about voting. But no, it's more than that. It's about justice. It's about wanting to ensure that there's fairness between people. That there's justice between people. The Prophet ﷺ, we see a beautiful example. Prior to Islam, when a man came to Mecca, And this man was buying and selling with some people. And a man promised to pay him back. He bought from him something. He said, I'll pay you tomorrow. So this man who's not from Mecca, who was from Yemen, came back to the Meccan the next day. said, okay, give me the money you promised. He said, come back to me tomorrow. So the Yemeni man came again. And the man said to him, come back tomorrow. This man's name was al ibn Wa'il, who was the Meccan. He said, come back tomorrow. Every day he kept telling him, come back tomorrow. Until he realized this guy does not intend to pay me anything. So, the Yemeni man had nothing, no one to defend him. He's not from Mecca, he has no tribe, he has no one to support him. So the Yemeni man stood in front of the Kaaba. Zakallah stood in front of the Kaaba and he began to tell people and recite poetry saying to people this man took my money and he's not giving it back and you people say that you are the defenders of the Kaaba and you're not even going to protect me or help me <coughs> so one of the elders of Mecca, Abdullah bin Jud'an, gathered all of the people and he said, we need to support that man who's been oppressed. And the Prophet was one of the people gathered. And they signed 
a contract, an oath called Hilf al Fudul, the oath of the righteous people, of the virtuous people. And they said, We will defend anyone who's being oppressed, even if they're not from our tribe. The Prophet ﷺ later on, when he was a prophet, that happened before prophethood. After prophethood, he walked by the place, the house that they signed that contract. And he said, I witnessed a contract in that house. Had I been offered the greatest riches amongst the people, if I was offered all of the riches to not sign that contract, I would not accept. And were I asked to sign it as after Islam has come, as a Muslim, I would still have signed it. And this is an example of the Prophet ﷺ partnering with people who are not Muslim to achieve a goal that is just and that is at its core Islamic. Delivering justice to other people. The Prophet was known as a Sadiq Al-Ameen, the trustworthy, the honest, before Islam. And that was necessary for people to take him seriously as a Prophet. If he wasn't advocating for people's rights and defending them and supporting them and helping them, he would not have been credible in his claim as being a Prophet. And when the Prophethood came to the Prophet ﷺ, Khadija said to the Prophet, you are the one who supports the weak. You are the one who cooperates in every matter of good. God can never humiliate a person like you. And that's what civic engagement is. Cooperating in everything that's good. It's not just voting. Voting is a means to an end. It's a means to promote better values amongst society. But it's not the end. And it's not all what civic engagement is. Civic engagement is everything that is cooperation for what is good. It's about getting engaged in your neighborhood groups. It's about being part of your neighborhood watch. It's about helping people support the homeless. It's about donating to food drives and food banks in your local cities. It's about every matter of good that we can put our hands to, towards. But I want you to understand something. When we talk about civic engagement, one problem that we have as Muslims is we say something that sometimes is problematic. We say, listen, let's go help other people. Let's go help other people, be good to our neighbors, feed the poor, vote, get involved politically, get involved civil in civil society, get involved civically. And then people will say, hey, Muslims are good people. They're good, they're generous, they're nice. We shouldn't hate them. And that is the wrong approach. If I gave sadaqah, if I gave donations, and my intention are for people to say, hey, Ibrahim is such a generous guy, then my intention is flawed, and my sadaqah is not accepted. We have to center our actions on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't center our actions on how people are going to receive us. Because let me tell you something. If we do everything right, if we feed the poor and we help the homeless and we open our doors to other people and we're nice and we're the, the model citizens, people could still hate us. The hearts of the people are between the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our intent and our object of worship is Allah Azza wa Jal. And we have to center our actions on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the signs that we are centering our actions on the people and the appreciation of people and our object of affection and sometimes even worship, quote unquote, is the pleasure of the people is that we're willing sometimes to compromise our beliefs in order for the people to like us. And that is a losing strategy. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنَ الْتَمَسْ رِضَ اللَّهِ فِي سَخَطِ النَّاسِ سَخَطَ اللَّهُ وَعَنْهُ وَأَسْخَطَ النَّاسِ عَنْ Whoever seeks the anger of God in order to gain the pleasure of the people, then God will be angry with him and so will the people. 
And whoever seeks the pleasure of God, even if it causes the people to be angry, that person will attain the pleasure of God and the pleasure of the people. Think of someone like Muhammad Ali, the boxer. When he said, I won't go to Vietnam. I will not do something that is oppressive and evil. What happened? The people hated him. And they cursed him. And they called him a coward. And they called him a traitor. But he was seeking not the pleasure of the people, but the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he did that, what ended up happening? Eventually, everyone loved him. Everyone loved him eventually. If we seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us all the protection that we want. If we seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we do what is right and what is good, not because it will make people like us, but because it will make Allah like us, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who can benefit us when no one else in the world wants to benefit us. And He's the one who can protect us when no one else in the world wants to protect us. And I hope, inshallah, everyone takes that message to heart and that we go out today as better people, encouraged, hopeful, optimistic, not afraid, and centering all of our actions on attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَقُولُوا قَوْلِ هَذَا اسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَلَكُمْ اسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَلَكُمْ اسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَلَكُمْ اسْتَ